Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Bancroft. I'm the curator of the British Pop Archive. Uh, welcome to the John Rylands Research Institute and Library for this event pre uh, presented by Creative Manchester in collaboration with the British Pop Archive. Uh, before I introduce this evening's guests, uh, I just need to cover some bits of housekeeping. Uh, there are no planned fire alarms this evening, uh, so if the alarm does go off, please follow the instructions from staff who will guide you safely to the nearest exit. Uh, and out to our meeting point uh, outside between the library and Sexy Fish, which is the restaurant next door. Uh, toilets are in the basement level, uh, which can be accessed by the lifts and stairs uh, in the modern entrance, so back out that way, or you can go back down the stairs and round. Um, there will be opportunities for questions uh, at the end, so um, when everything finishes, if you raise your hand, we'll bring around a roving mic and uh, you can ask questions. So to our guest. Uh, Alan Edwards is the godfather of modern music public relations. He's the founder of PR agency, The Outside Organization, and has worked with everyone from David Bowie to Blondie, the Rolling Stones to the Spice Girls, Prince to Amy Winehouse. His company continued to represent a diverse range of clients, including some of the biggest music stars on the planet. Corporations and brands, government departments, royalty, celebrities, charities, events, and sporting legends. Tonight's In Conversation celebrates the release of Alan's memoir, I Was There, Dispatches from a Life in Rock and Roll. Alan was an early supporter of the British Pop Archive project, and naturally we worked with Alan and his team at the outside organisation to launch the project nationally back in 2022. And so we are delighted to be able to host this event here at the Rylands for him this evening. Conducting tonight's In Conversation is Andy Spinoza, another early supporter of the Pop Archive, and whose personal archive we now hold here at the library. He founded the magazine City Life in 1983, and from 1988 to 1998 reported on the music scene for the Manchester Evening News. He then had a 25-year PR career with his own agency, including the pr promoting the city of Manchester worldwide. Now an author, his 2023 book, Manchester Unspun, is an account of the city's extraordinary transformation. So please give a warm round of applause and welcome to the stage Andy Spinoza and Alan Edwards. E evening everybody you can, can you hear me at the back okay Matt's done all the intros so uh, we shall kick off um, with a quick question to the audience how many PR or journalists PR people or journalists are in the audience okay two. so three I think so for the rest so I, I divide the world into two types of people those in the media and those civilians who are not au fait with what goes on behind the stories that they're reading in the papers or seeing on the telly and all the, the rich stew of agendas and leaking and spinning and selling information and all that kind of stuff that, that you civilians will be, be hearing about tonight because uh, Alan's career is, you know, if, if I was to read out all of his clients from top to bottom, would be here all night. So just starting with the Bs, he's worked with, with everyone from Blondie to Bowie. Bolan. The Beckhams. Beckhams. That's four and Bs. He, he even somehow, and he will tell you why, uh, managed to put together for a photo session John Bon Jovi and Gordon Brown, PM. That's very true. Yeah. So that's just the Bs. And, we're not going to... And Blair, of course. Who's that? Blair, Blair and Bowie. Blair How can we forget So we've got him? six Bs now. Um, <coughs> so that I kind of want to get into... I want to start with my own journey. 16 years old in London, reading the music press, the NME, the sounds. And I was reading these really thrilling stories of punk rock, bands falling out, riots at gigs... Um, great characters, and I thought it was just journalists writing about what they saw. But, Alan, behind the scenes, there were narratives being written, and Malcolm McLaren causing riots. At yeah, the, I mean, so, sometimes that about that time, that <coughs> the period? McLaren one's particularly good, yeah. Um, I was in a pub called the Nashville Rooms in West Kensington, and there was about 20, 30 people in there, max. Um, and there was this group with a funny name called the Sex pistols or something playing and it was a bit of a racket and um, as as the show was going on I noticed this guy with wild hair and a gabardine mac running around the, 
the venue and bumping into people, knocking people's drinks. And after a few minutes, all these melees broke out and there's all kinds of fights going on and all the rest of it. And I thought, this is really strange. It was like a whirling dervish, you know. And then I noticed he'd pulled out a photographer. The photographer keeps, starts taking pictures. So you've got a big fight and the band's somewhere in the background. Um, and I remember a week later, I watched this very clearly. A week later, it's the front page of Melody Maker, right at Sex Pistols gig. So McLaren was like the agent provocateur making these things happen. Mm. And um, it's funny, Steve Jones had read the book, read that chapter, and he called me up um, a couple of weeks ago and he said, he said, oh, you, you know, it was great. It brought back a lot of memories. You really got the atmosphere. He said, however, you missed the opening band. I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, they were the 101ers just morphing into the clash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But there, were, there was a lot of that. But sometimes you could create your own um, things. And Malcolm was a very inspirational figure, one of the greatest PR people ever, in a way. And I remember I was looking after a band called Generation X. Um, that spawned Billy Idol, who went on to become a big star in America. And we, I, th I don't even know if they got a record deal, but we were looking for some publicity. And I hit on this idea, why don't we do a tour of America? Now, they were lucky if they could get a gig in a pub at that point, let alone go to the States. Um, so we got, we got out on the, went out on the um, tube train to Terminal 3, I think it was then, walked around there, got a photographer, and we did this thing where we sort of, I got the band to come out, got the pictures, and it's like they're pushing through the doors and past a few bemused sort of tourists. Um, and I spun up and said, like, Generation X Conquer America, back from big tour. <laughs> and I wasn't sure whether it would work. <coughs> and coming in on the train to work next week, and I opened like the NME and it was like, you know, Gen X, it, you know, it was like Shea Stadium next, you know. Yeah. Um, in those pre-social media days, no one could really check it, you know. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So I, I sort of... Brilliant. I mean, I think as well, um, so, so the McLaren thing, your Gen X, Generation X story and those sorts of things were, were stunts really, weren't they? They were very basic news creation yeah. um, that you could get away with. But as your business, and in fact, I mean, Mal Malcolm took a lot of that from the 60s, and he really? was a big fan of Andrew Lou Goldham, mm. who did the Stones things, and a very famous one, there's no one here old enough to know, but um, when he got two members, he wanted an antidote to the Beatles, who was super sort of lovely next door type of thing. So he got two of the members of the group, I think it was Bill Wyman, and I can't remember, maybe it was Charlie, and he got them to um, urinate against a petrol pump at a, sta a petrol station. And it went crazy. It was the front page of the mirror and everything. Well, the you photographs. Know. Yeah. Uh, he got, um, he got a, a and, snapper there. And they, yeah, and they got... <laughs> it, somehow this story got leaked out. And I remember they got fined. They had to go to Great Marlborough Street Court or something. They got fined five quid each. But the publicity went round the world. It yep. was worth millions. It wasn't the headline, would you let your daughter marry a Rolling that Stone? That was it. So, so McLaren was a student of all that stuff mm. and sort of copying it. And then I was probably getting ideas from Malcolm. And but you're also connected. getting ideas from the guy who first took you on. So you were a reviewer you were, uh, yep. for, for the music press and you tell us the story of how you got your first job and what Keith, Keith Altham, is that right? What he was famous for in well, terms of stunts. Keith Altham was the doyen of, of PRs really and, and there weren't any music PRs in those days so he was kind of the first one. There was a guy called Les Perrin who had the greatest um, client list for you PRs over there, the greatest client list I've ever seen. At one point, he had the Beatles, the Craze, um, <laughs> the Stones, and Harold Wilson, which I think must be, that's got to be every PR's dream to rep that lot. Um, but Keith had the, all the great rock stars. He had the whole of the Woodstock generation, you know, so Stones, Animals, everyone you could think of. And he was very famous for having told Jimmy as in Jimi Hendrix at Monterey Pop to set fire to his guitar, which became one of the great rock stars. And I stars. thought that was purely spontaneous. If only when I read your no, book. And, and he no, and Keith I always told me, he then got told, he actually was being paid to rep, rep the Who, and he got told off by the Who because the stunt was so good. So yeah. Peter had to go and smash up his guitars <laughs> to, make, to equal it, actually. Um, so I was reviewing for Sounds or Record Mirror, one of those music papers, and I came up to a gig at Bingley um, in Staffordshire, and it was, a, it was an agricultural hall, terrible acoustics, the Who were playing. And afterwards, um, Keith Alton said, what did you think of the show? And I'm a massive Who fan. I said, well, I don't think they were that good tonight, really. 
But anyway, strangely, he said, would you like a job in PR? And I thought, well, I don't know about that. They all look like sort of duckers and divers. It all looks a bit shifty PR. I don't, I'd rather be a writer, you know. Um, so he said, well, I could, I could pay you £25 a week. And I thought, well, hang on. I'm struggling to pay my rent in Islington, which was £4 a week, and I couldn't come up with the money. So I thought, well, I'll do it for a month or two and just get my finances sorted out. Um, and that was half a century ago. So I, I, I the world's lost it. Mu music journalism. You could have been... Uh, could have been still writing for <laughs> <a> defunct <laughs> record. Mirror. I might have gotten to Mojo by now. <laughs> so... You, you're eight, you, you know, you, set, you, you were working with Keith and you set up on your own and PR, well, the art of PR became more sophisticated, didn't it? Because it was, uh, rather than just stunts yeah. and your clients became bigger and bigger. Um, so you could take us through that kind of process because you didn't jump from, you know, work for Keith Alton to work with the Rolling Stones immediately, did you? There was a period of growth. And who, what kind of, Big Country was one of the ones you worked with. Yeah, yeah I mean, when punk, I, I mean, Keith trained me, so I worked on some really big acts, The Who, Mark Boland, stuff like that, um, Hawkwind. But when punk came along, I knew a lot of the people. I'd known them from school, and it was quite a small scene. And so I, I ended up representing um, quite quickly Stranglers, Damned, and the Buzzcocks, the great Buzzcocks. I think Steve's here tonight. Yeah. Um, and so I had this sort of roster. And I became like a bit of a crossroads for Fleet Street, who wanted to write about these bands and all the magazines, but didn't know how to access them. And I was sort of part of the scene. So I suddenly found myself in a pivotal position there. And then I remember um, I was managing a girl called Hazel O'Connor, who'd had a big hit with um, a film called Breaking Glass. And um, people kept saying to me, um, by the way, Bowie's checking you out. Bowie's watching you. And it was getting really weird. I was sort of looking over my shoulder. Where is he? You know, every time I walked down the street. Um, and he did turn up eventually at this gig at the Music Machine in Camden Town. And I then got, did get a call and I got to meet him. And he interviewed me and I was then flown out to New York, which is a very exciting thing to do. I mean, when you went to New York in those days, you'd be telling people about it for months. Oh, yeah. I'm going to New York. Oh, I'm like, you know. Did, yeah. um, he interviewed me f over two days and he was very forensic. And what he was interested in was my knowledge of the media, but particularly young journalists coming through. So, you know, Dylan Jones, Tony Parsons, Paul Morley, and all the magazines like ID, The Face, The Enemy, um, and that was really significant to him in terms of him uh, hiring me. So I was in a more sophisticated type of place, I suppose, by then. Well, let's, let's come back to Bowie because it's such an important part uh, of, in, in a while. Because I, I want to, you know, my next question really is about uh, the heart of any PR relationship, you know, PR and an artist. There's this, there are two people. I mean, there's a big brand but you and that, that artist have got to share a lot of trust, or they, they're putting their trust in you. Um, so how does, did you cope with that pressure, that expectation? Because there's an expectation, isn't there, that you're going to get great media coverage, yeah. and you're going to somehow magically uh, it make go away uh, nasty people who want to write nasty things. And there's a lot on the shoulders of, of that person in that relationship of trust. I mean, whether it's Bowie or others, how yeah, did you cope I mean, with that? I really felt it. I mean, actually, I worked with the Stone slightly before Bowie, so that's sort of 81 into 82. Mm. Um, and I had a call from Harvey Goldsmith one day, and he said, um, hello, Alan, it's Harvey here. Do you want to represent the Stones? It was as simple as that. And I thought, well, <coughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, and I won't go through the whole interview process. It was quite, that's, that's a story in itself. But it was, it's, it was a very heavy pressure. And I was suddenly propelled from sort of working with bands down at the Roxy Club to this, this band that was selling out. At that time, they were doing the football stadiums around Europe. No one had played stadiums before. So, and they were earning a million dollars a night. I mean, this is unthinkable money in 1981, 82. And Mick... Mick's demands, because Mick was sort of like the manager of the group in a lot of respects. Um, he wanted dossiers on every single journalist before he did an interview. He wanted to see all their previous articles. He wanted to know what the journalists liked, which songs they wanted to hear. Um, 
And I found that working with the stones, it was like working around the clock because Jagger was very much an early bird um, and he'd be out doing a run at 7, 7.30 in the morning and he'd want, I'd have to run along behind him and trying to brief him. And then Richard Young, the photographer, would pop out of the bushes and get a picture of Mick training. Um, and then the rest, that was just the beginning of my day. Um, and then I would maybe go to... Uh, newspapers and meet journalists and arrange things for later in the day and then I'd have to go to the stadium and get all the photo passes and tickets. Um, you'd see the concert. After the concert, um, as I say, Jagger would pull me aside. He'd say, well, which songs did they like? Did they like Jumping Jack Flash? Because if you're in Italy, what they, the audience wanted might be different to what they were enjoying in Germany or around so you expected Parker's to or watch every show and... Report and report back. back to Mick and say, well, this song's, you know, that song's working, this song isn't working. And then Keith um, only did interviews after midnight. Um, <laughs> oh, and Bill Wyman would always want a chat about 11 o'clock at night. So I'd have to go up to Bill's room and Bill would always be there in a dressing gown having a cup of tea. And he'd call me in and he'd want to know about what the media was saying. It was always very suspicious because he always said it, it was just about to turn in. But when I found out he led a wild life later, <laughs> I obviously, I, I missed something. But you get, then I'd have to go to Keith's room and it would be pitch black with sort of incense going and people lying around on the floor and the light, the light would always have a sort of, sort of material over it. So it was like walking into a sort of casbah in Morocco. And he'd, he'd do the odd interview and it would always be, well, you know, and he did that would take you to two or three in the morning. And then my next job um, was all the band wanted a sort of news sheet under their door at 6, 6.30 when they woke up with their croissants and coffee. Now, it was, what they wanted was the reviews from the night before. So they had to be translated. I would have to go and get the papers at midnight. I knew to go to, I knew from my punk days, go to a railway station. So I'd be at a station at Dusseldorf at 1 a.m. buying newspapers running back to the hotel, I'd bribe someone with tickets who would give me a bad translation, you know, what it meant. Um, I would then, I, if I, I had my case, I had all these magazines, sort of, um, I had like communist propaganda magazines, I had crime thriller magazines from America, because they'd like them created, a whole fanzine thing created, so every day had to be like a different magazine with this sort of true crime and cover. People think that PR from, I, from, is hanging out yeah. with celebrities, parties, so it's, the grunt work involved. It's three in the morning, I'm cutting out all these magazines, I don't have any staff or anything, gluing them together, stapling them together, I have to have about 30 or 40 of them. 6.30 in the morning, I'm running around these hotels, it'd be like the Kempinski in Berlin, very big hotel, sticking them under doors. And I remember um, the staff were sent up to investigate what this kid was doing. I mean, <laughs> what is going on? And I said, I said, oh, Rolling Stones, that's is good, that's is good, okay. Um, so I would have had to go around all the 40 rooms and stick this thing under the door by then. So I was working about an 18 hour day and I was existing on coffee and cigarettes and it pretty much drove me to a nervous breakdown. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, people often say to me, and you, you may have it, they say, what do you need to be a PR, entertain PR? And I would always say stamina. Mm. They say, what do you mean? You're just sitting at a desk. I say, well, no, if you're going to be out every night of the week doing this stuff, you've, you've got to be pretty fit. So as Andy says, far from living the high life and hanging out at parties and clubs, I, I, was, I was cutting these bits of paper out and stapling <laughs> them together. And um, you often got caught between Mick and Keith, did you? I mean, yeah. you, you describe it as like a, a court with two, with two emperors or something, something yeah. similar, you know. And it, it was they, were like playing, they played games with people, it seemed to me, and they, they come out a little bit, little, a bit cruel, dealing with the people that, that, well, that they worked were, for them. They were proper outlaws and proper... I mean, and I, I love the Stones, and, and as individuals, they were all great, but it was like a medieval court, and the politics, especially between Keith and Mick, would be incredible. And they would conduct, at that point in the 80s, they, their relationship was quite dysfunctional. Um, and they would trade blows through the media. So it was me that would get the call, you know, so it'd be me, oh, I can't believe it, what Keith's done, can you leak it to the mirror? So I'd do that. And then the next day, you know, I'd be called to Keith's room, you know. Um, I remember him saying, these words were in my head, he said, listen here, sonny boy, Jim, I effing run the Rolling Stones, not that puff Mick Jagger. <laughs> um, 
the, getting so, paid to, to leak against so the client. I, yeah, it was really getting tricky. Um, and I spent a good time with Mick, uh, quite a bit of time with Mick, and he made a solo time, album around that time, and I would tour with him. And I, I, you get to know a client very well for a short space of time. So I'd be going around to his house in Phil Beach Road, and Jerry was there, and the kids, and you be, sort of become part of the family. But, but you're not, because you're very dispensable as well, you know. Mm. Um, so with Mick, it was always business, but I had a good rapport with Keith, because Keith loved to talk about music. That's all he wanted to talk about. And he especially wanted to talk about blues and reggae. And he had a house in Jamaica at the time, um, and that was a really strong subject for me. So I could talk about Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaac. So I had this sort of relationship going with Keith and one with Mick and it was like having an incredible sort of affair or something, you know, not letting the other one know. Is it the, ca <laughs> is it the case that journalists rarely got interviews with the two of them? You know, that, there was, that it was one or the other? Um, or did yeah. you ever sit, you know? I don't really remember. Uh, you're right, it would be one or the other. I remember um, Nick Kent, who's a very famous writer at the time, was going to do a piece for The Enemy, and he was going to do the whole band. Okay. And I remember I took him down to the uh, canteen, the band's canteen at Wembley or somewhere, and I remember we sat down and had breakfast with Keith Richards' dad, who was called Bert. And I always remember he had a copy, a rolled up copy of the Daily Mirror sticking out of his back pocket, and he ordered egg and beans, yeah, the cap. It was like Andy Cap. <laughs> Very nice bloke, but it was sort of not what you expect. Anyway, Nick was keen to go out and get really what it was like with all the stones and Mick and Keith and get a feel for the band. So he goes out and I've got it all lined up. We're going to have the front cover of the enemy and you know, EMI going to put their advertising campaign behind it. A few days go by and I'm, you know, where, where, where's Neil? And da, 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 da. After, after a week, Nick Kent hasn't returned. Um, and the editors call him up, Nick Logan well-known well editor, so well, where is he? And I'm saying, oh, don't, don't worry, he's just getting some extra copies, he's just getting really in-depth with the band. <laughs> Two weeks goes by, and everyone's tearing their hands, <laughs> I've got, we've got a front cover, where is it? You know, three weeks, EMI are going crazy at me, you've built this entire PR campaign around it, and the piece still hasn't appeared. And, you know, it sounds funny, but there's no social media, there's no mobile phones. Yeah. And when you were on the road, nobody, especially with the Rolling Stones, Nobody knew where you were. So the best of my knowledge, Nick's still on tour with the band. <laughs> but actually, that panic over an, uh, an enemy front cover does remind people who aren't old enough to remember or know how central those yeah. music papers were. You know, you, you couldn't hear uh, music, your music on the radio. You had to, you know, news travelled, it now travels at the speed of light. It travelled one, one week at a time back then when the papers came out and yep. they were so influential in terms of sales and, and reputation weren't there nick kemp was probably trying to get a glimpse of that relationship between mick and keith that uh, that perhaps they didn't want i mean yeah i remember um, band interview when i was a journalist it's nightmare to interview the band or more than one person because they're actually just talking performatively with reference to the person they're not you're not getting quotes, you're not getting a good story unless you get the one person. Yeah. And Rob Gretton used to say to Paul Morley, don't interview Joy Division, but it's a bunch of idiots, write what you like, make it all up. You know, which of course, the Morley did brilliantly. Um, but did, um, I suppose... Do you remember when Bowie formed mm. Tim Machine and the idea was that it was a democracy and he was just one other band and he didn't want to be treated differently. So I had to take... Journalists say, for some reason, we did a lot of stuff in Dublin. And I'd take journalists out there and say, right, remember, you've got to talk to all four members. So Hunt and Tony Sales, you know, and Reeves Cabrales, and just treat David like a guy in the band. Don't sort of, you know. Do. And of course, the journalists were really peed off because, of course, really, what, they didn't want the Hunt Sales exclusive. <laughs> they wanted David. So they had to go through this whole sort of thing of talking to Hunt for 15 minutes and da da da. And finally, they get the David Bowie bit. And Tony Parsons was sent out to do it, I think for GQ or someone. Mm -hmm. And he decided he wasn't going to play this game. So he sat down in the room with them and he spoke at length to Hunt and Tony and Reeves. And they said, that's it, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Bowie, Bowie flipped out. He, he said, what about me? Why haven't you spoken to me? You know? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and I think... Um, I wanted to, I mentioned Joy Division because I wanted to talk 
about your relationship with Manchester bands. I know yeah. uh, it, they were more in the, in the punk and post-punk days, weren't they? But Buzzcocks and, and Joy Division, can, can, you not, know... Not you with Joy Division, but Buzzcocks especially, and we were chatting with Steve um, Diggle just now mm -hmm. before, and we were talking, I mean, I remember going to the Electric Circus with them and some early line-ups there, it was fantastic. And... Um, I used to bring Jonas up from London, and it was it was like it was a big thing coming to Manchester in those days. You know, it was it was like a different thing, and um, <laughs> Manchester's happening. I mean, it's a great city. Um, but um, actually, I remember once I contributed towards a song title. I think, um, uh, and. We were stand We went round to Pete Shelley's place, and it was a basement, and it was like a bomb had hit it. You know, students sort of digs with piles of dishes and clothes everywhere, and there was a guy from Record Mirror and the photographer Jill Fermanowski, I think. Anyway, we went to get a bus into Sol from Salford into the city, and it was pretty hard in those days. And we're standing by the bus stop in the rain, and Pete said to me, "I've just written a new song, but I can't think of a title for it. Have you got any ideas?" So I wandered around the back of a bus stop, the bus stop, and I looked through, there was a public library, and I looked through the window and it said, fiction, romance. Mm. So I came back to Pete and said, oh, what about that as a title? And he said, great, and that became a single. But I did tell this story a few years ago at uh, another place, and Jill Fermanowski, who's the photographer, stood up suddenly in front of the whole crowd and said, no, 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 it was me. So <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know who, who came up with it, but... So there was the Buzzcocks. I worked with New Order later on, actually. Uh -huh, um, New Order, not Joy Division. And that was, that was great. And I, got to, I went on a book tour with Bernard, who's really great company. Um, mm. And also, although he's sort of not a Manchester band, but I did manage Billy Duffy because I managed the cult. And ah. Billy was in one of the... He was in the first band with Morrissey. Yeah, so he's yeah, part yeah, yeah. of the real origins of the Manchester scene. And um, we, we toured all around America, spent a lot of time with Billy. And... Our whole, a lot of our dialogue, a lot of bands on the road, football is, is the language. And in those days, again, you couldn't sort of, especially in America, you couldn't get the football results. They weren't in newspapers, there was no, they weren't <laughs> on the TV. So whoever got the results first was like really important. So I'd phone in, I'd get all the results and I'd go into the catering room or the bar and read them out slowly like an announcer. And Billy was a City fanatic, even way back before City were, you know, super successful. So we had this whole relationship based on uh, Man City. So there was that. And of course, the Beckhams. Days, yes. Which, like, like you, a Londoner. Yeah, East End boy. Came up here. Yeah. I uh, rather pathetically laid claim to writing the first gossip piece about Beckham in the Manchester Evening News. It was National, you. For the National Trust. I've been looking for you. But it was, yeah. But you uh, formed a kind of very close working relationship, didn't you? And that, yeah. and even before he was sort of massively yeah. famous, well, he was maybe on the cusp of becoming... Yeah, he, he actually had only just got into the United team um, and I'd been introduced, I think he'd met Victoria at that time. I was working with the Spice Girls and um, I remember David invited me round to his digs, you know, and it was like, I, again, I, I keep saying Salford, but it, it, was, it wasn't in the town centre. And to give you an idea, it was, it was Worsley, like, actually. Was it? In okay. Salford, part of Salford, yeah. And, right. And it was really basic. And to give you an idea what it's like, it was like one room up, one room down type of thing. And we walked in and I had to give them 10p or whatever it was, a coin for the meter because I couldn't get the lights on. Um, and then he sat down to make, he was making dinner. It was only me and him. And he couldn't find a can opener for the beans. So it gives you an idea. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, what, what's, how can I get to Piccadilly? What's the last train back to London? <laughs> and there's a snow outside. And I said, you know, and he said, um, he had this sort of, very shy. So I got this vision for football. I'm thinking, really? Because at that time I had, worked for a few footballers and they usually wanted to get into Hacienda or get a new suit or something like that. And David said, no, I've got, got this vision for football. And he said, I hate racism. I'm really going to fight against it. I really hate misogyny. I'm, I want women's, I'm really into women's soccer. I think it's going to be important. I think football in America is going to be massive. Uh, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, this, this is incredible. So I'm starting to scribble it down. Mm. Um, and he's got this entire, it's like he's seen the next 50 years. So it, it was, um, I went, 
I remember thinking, yeah, I don't know if I missed the last train or not, but it was like the whole sum of the basis of Brand Beckham. I mean, I literally wrote it in the back of a train ticket. Could he afford night. to pay you fees at that stage? Or did you kind of, was a bit uh, of artist development? There was development? an agent called Tony Stevens. Mm. Um, he was a very nice man. And he would got Adidas. I think Adidas had just started working with David and they were paying, they were paying my sort of... Yeah. Uh, fee. I remember the first interview David ever did here, the first major one, was a magazine called Esquire, which was a big deal at the time. And Ian Penman was the journalist. And I came up with him on the train, and like a lot of journalists, he was very, very, you know, he expressed himself through the pen. So he yes. was like, a man of very few I've words. I've met him, he's not... Um, very quiet. M not Mr. Gregarious. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting on the train with him saying, well, great weather we're having, isn't it? Was, the football was good last night, and yeah. I didn't get a word out of him all the way up. And I said, yeah. oh, my God. Because I knew da David was incredibly shy. And he would be, he'd actually be looking at the floor when he was talking to you and stuff like that. So, so this is going to be lively. And we had a room at the Malmaison, the uh, McCutnell's place. And we, they sat down there, a bit like Andy and I, except there wasn't an audience. And um, I, I'm sitting there, so well, this, this is David back at me, and this is, this is here, and he's come up from a squire. And there was silence. <laughs> oh, oh my God. So I... After I, I, I started filling it with stories, I said, guys, did yeah. I ever tell you about <laughs> yeah. when I was out with Mick and Keith and the Rolling Stones? <laughs> and they started engaging with that. Anyway, this went on for 20 minutes. And I thought, well, this is all going very well as a, as a piece of sort of theatre, but we're not going to get the interview done. So I said, you know what? Oh, God, I'm very, I realised at the time I got a very urgent call to make. I've got to go out. Sorry, you know. So I left them to it, and I went for a walk around this, the city, you know, and came back an hour later, walked in, and they were chatting away, and it was all great. Um, so that's really maybe where the origins of this book came about. And I did practice a lot of these stories just to yeah. get through these yeah. difficult situations. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that some clients want um, the PR in, in the interview. Yeah. Because they want the PR to jump in when there's a question that they don't like. Uh, now, I had, when I ran a PR agency, yeah. I told clients that was bad news, that was a bad uh, approach because journalists would just write that yeah. up. And what, did you ever get asked and did you, as, a, as a kind of instruction uh, yeah, to be I, I that certainly, defensive PR? Yeah, I certainly got asked, and particularly when you're dealing with American artists, you get a lot of this, well, the journalist has got to stay on message and you've mm -hmm. got to stay in lane. I, I, I never did that once. I would always make an excuse or forget to do it and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes probably get fired because of it. Yeah. Because, but I, was, I, I respect and love journalism. I'd wanted to be a writer in the first place and there's no, you know, there's no way I was going to interrupt the flow. And if, if an artist can't handle themselves mm. for 20 minutes in a room with someone else, then that's poor show, isn't it? So do you think P, uh, journalists make the best PRs or ex-journalists um, because they understand what, that, what the media needs? Uh, yeah, I do, basically, because I think that the art of being a PR, I mean, it, it's an extension of journalism. Um, really, you're a storyteller, because you look at a client who might be might be quite dull, actually, if you know, and, and you, you'll meet someone and they'll say, what have you done? They say, oh, I've sold... 10 million albums and I've, I've, you know, whatever, and I've played these theatres. I go, yeah, but w w what's interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And you have to dig deep, and then you find out that their hobby is sort of, I don't know, jigsaw puzzles, or one big rock star I know collect has model trains at home, you know? And then you think, well, that's the angle. It's not for you. Yeah, and they say, why do you need an angle? I say, well, you need an angle to interest them in you, and then you can spout off about all the records you've sold and, and mm -hmm. sell the tickets and... and um, so forth. I've, I've gone off the question there, haven't I, Andy? No, um, it was just about uh, j journalists uh, and PRs and, uh, and you, you, the fact you, you, you have respect for journalism as opposed to the kind of PRs who might patronise journalists or just expect them to run yeah. press release. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, gr the great... I mean, I've been privileged to work for really great people, you know, like, um, like the Bowies and the Jaggers. I mean, they were wouldn't think of having you interrupt. They would hate it. I mean, yeah. with David, it was normal. David loved writers, and he really enjoyed talking to them. And he knew a lot of them. I mean, it was very hard to stop him doing the interviews. I'd have to come in and say, David, you know, da, da, and he'd say, oh, yeah, I'm enjoying this, you know. Um, you've got a great story. Sorry to interrupt, but you've got a great story, haven't you, about when Bowie came to Manchester to do Mark and Lard. Yeah. And he did a little bit more. Than he, he, I'll, I'll tee up for you. Go on. 
Yeah, so we, I mean, David as a, as a person was very self-effacing and very modest. Uh, our office was in Tottenham Court Road. Sometimes he'd walk up and down Tottenham Court Road. He wouldn't have any minders or anyone with him. And he'd just, I think, how do you manage that? And he said, well, I always carry a Greek newspaper. I said, why? And he said, well, everyone thinks I'm Greek. I can't be David Bowie. So one day we had to come up and do Mark and Lard, and he liked them, and it was a, they had a Ready One shirt at that time, and they were very, they had this great zany sort of humour. So we get to Euston Station, it's just myself and David and Julian who work with me, and we just get the normal train. Um, and we're sitting there, and people, a few people are looking, thinking, and then they think, well, it can't be David Bowie, because he's sitting there with everyone else on the train. We get up... Um, do the interview with Mark and Lard. And then David, because he could be very mischievous in a great sense of humour, he said, you know what, do you mind if I do the um, traffic reports to the rest of the show? <laughs> and Mark and Lard, well, whatever you want, you know. So he did all the reports for the, for the next hour and a half. And then things like, there's a pile-up on the M62 and the traffic around Liverpool. And he did it for the whole show, and not one <coughs> single person clocked it or rang in or anything. You know, because how could how could it be David Bowie? Um, once Brilliant. I did his voice actually. We were in Australia, and he'd done a lot of radio interviews. And like a lot of those '60s artists, he loved newsprint. And like if you if you were in the Times or the Guardian, it was really important. But radio was a bit ephemeral. We had done it, and it had gone, and he didn't really didn't have the same significance to him. And he'd been doing all these interviews, and um, he said to me, oh, Alan, one day, he said, can you do it? And I thought, well, I can, really, because I've heard you do this every day for the last 30 days. I know it off by heart, what you're going to say about Let's Dance and this, that, and the other. So I did this interview, and it was syndicated across Australia. And um, I thought, well, someone's going to pick up on it. And I, nobody ever said a word. And I, I could only... Did you do an impression of it? No, but I suppose we did come from the same part of London, yeah. but I could only conclude that to Australia, and all, Australia and <laughs> all us poms sound the same, don't we? <laughs> We've got an Australian over here who can no verify one that. That's, that's brilliant. Um, let's talk about one relationship that, that ended badly because... Uh, oh, not that one. Well, you run, you know, in, P, well, in PR, you get hired, hired, you get fired. But the way Paul McCartney and you... Um, after the work you did for him, uh, part of company, was yeah. kind of unusual, wasn't it? You, you know, I'm not, it's in the book, great stories, by the way, a million of them, but this one particularly interested me. He poached your top guy, yeah. your, your guy that you had put Pages on his account. Guy. Yeah. He took him and said, I'm, I'm not working with outside organisation anymore, and you had a little uh, discussion about um, how much he should, how much compensation he should pay, put it that way. No, it wasn't so much compensation, unfortunately. Um, when he came and joined us, he produced a 60-page contract. I'd never seen a 60-page contract, especially not for PR, which is, you know, not that serious a thing. It wasn't like I did signing up his song rights or something. Yeah. And it took me three months, and I had to pay lawyers a lot of money to go through this thing, finally sign this agreement. Anyway, some years later, he decides he wants to go off and he wants to poach this kid. And so I said, well, it's all very well, but, you know, um, I need three months' notice because I've got to find a replacement and, you know, whatever. Mm. And it, his, his manager rung up and was really, um, it was really abusive, actually, to be honest, you know, effing this and that and the other. Um, so it was pretty, pretty nasty. So it ended up Paul and I were writing letters to each other. And I remember in one of them, I, was, I, was, I don't know if I put it, but I was, I was thinking, you're only the Westlife of your generation or something <laughs> like that. It was, you know, and I, th I couldn't believe that there I was having this. And I said to him, look, this is a family business. This is a small business. I haven't got a lot of money, you know, and you, can just, you, know, you could destabilise and all my client could go and all the rest of it. I couldn't yeah, believe it. Mean, three months' notice is pretty standard. It wasn't. It? it wasn't a very big deal. I couldn't believe there was I having an argument with the Beatles. But in all honesty, <laughs> to this day, um, when Beatles come on and Chandrim will testify this, when the Beatles come on Spotify and stuff, I, I can't. I have to jump the track, you know, because yeah. it still makes me upset. Um, um, I'm all right with John Lennon songs. That's <laughs> fine. Or when John's doing the vocal on it. Um, but sometimes getting fired can be funny. There was this guy, yes. Michael Flatley, the dancer, River Dance, who hired me. And um, he, I, I can't remember why, anyway, he, he fired me, you know. You, it, as, as, as Andy says, it's, it happens all the time. Anyway, I then got, a couple of years later, the manager rung up and said, um, would you work for Michael Flatley? 
So I said, yeah, okay. I, didn't, I thought, look, you know, I need the money, of course, yeah. So I get called to this big meeting in the boardroom at Universal. And I walk in, there's about 30 or 40 people, and there's flatly at the end. And what you have to do, they go around the table and everyone says what they do. So someone says, I'm head of promotion, I'm head of marketing, and it gets to me, and I said, I, I'm Alan Edwards, the PR. And he stops, he looks at me, he said, um, he said didn't I fire you once? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, you did. He said, well, you're fired again. <laughs> And I had to walk out, and it was like a walk of shame in front of all these executives. But the good thing was, what he didn't realise, he paid me in advance. Uh, so brilliant. So I wasn't so unhappy That's about brilliant. that one. And, and weirdly, he called me up last year. His manager said, "Oh, would you be okay to work for Michael and take some press out of Ireland?" I kept quiet. I didn't, I mean, Did you I, say I there was a book coming out, and, <laughs> <laughs> and he might feature it? <laughs> I mean, I do want to ask you about the timing of the book because you still run, a, 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 you know, a, a massively uh, well-respected res business. You've got music business clients, yeah, and you're telling stories. Um, and I presume that it, you know it was legal, and you, there was probably stories you haven't put in. But you're telling stories about previous clients, yeah. And was there a nervousness, perhaps, that that, um, you know, that you're disclosing stuff that was between, uh, in relationships you had years ago mainly, but the nervousness that some clients might say, oh, wow, well, the stuff we're doing now, he might write a sequel. I don't know. Is, is I that... probably will, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, did, you, did, did, did your partners in the business uh, have, have a, uh, worries about any commercial impact? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I was certainly nervous about it. I wasn't sure how it would play out at all. Um, I mean, the book's not nasty no. and it's not salacious, um, but that's because that's my perspective on it. I've largely enjoyed it and I've been privileged to work with all these people. Uh, I, see the, I see the funny side of most of it because that's yes. the only way you can survive it, really. Um, and I didn't really have any scores to settle, so I wasn't overly worried. But I, mean, I did ring up one client, very famous household name, I won't, better not say her name, and I said, I just thought I'd better let you know that I've written a book. I was silence. And I'm going, hello, you, you're still there? I thought I'd, I'd lost the signal. Not a word. And, and, and literally then there was a click. So I, but I'm still working with them, so that was all right. Uh, <laughs> and I thought with some of the acts like, um, you know, I did, I did write to them. I didn't share the stuff with them because if you do that then you're gonna no. you're never gonna get the book published they're gonna say no I was wearing blue shoes not pink shoes you've got it wrong um, but I wrote to most of the protagonists and they were all um, most of them were very encouraging and and I mean for instance Debbie Harry was lovely she goes you know she gave some quotes for yeah. the book yeah. um, she said Steve and the pistols Roger Daltrey said fantastic things mostly people seem to have enjoyed it. So those are people, those are artists who obviously have an awareness that, you know, of the world and how it works, but some artists, I mean, some clients in, in every field have unrealistic expectations and, yeah. and, when, and things do go wrong, don't they? However much you tr uh, a PR can uh, try and set, set a journalist up with a narrative, things happen, obviously bad, bad stories happen. Did you ever get that kind of shoot the messenger, I call it kicking the dog, you know, um, event where they blaming you for stuff that's out, out of your control? Yeah, I mean, my back's riddled with, you know, <laughs> smarks all over it. I mean, the, the thing that happens, and it, it really happens with largely with lesser artists, you know, mm. um, but they make an album, they have some success, and then the second album doesn't work. Must and, and you've created loads of publicity for them. It must be must be the PR's fault. I mean, we had one um, last year. Went on holiday, which is not something I do very often. Um, mm. First day we get there, and a, a lawyer calls me up and says, um, "Oh well, my, my clients decided. You know, they they don't want to work with me." I said, "Well, this is not possible. They just had a big spread in the Telegraph. They've been all over the Times. I I can't believe it. You know, this, this must be a mistake." And they said, "No, no, 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 no," and they said. Um, I said, by the way, you must never tell anyone you've been fired. You can't talk about any of this and this, that, the other. And I thought, I said, well, you, you've made a mistake there because there was no contract. I never signed a contract, so bad luck. I'm going to, I'm going to use that as an anecdote for yeah. years to come. Yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, um, 
I was very, it affected me for the first week of the holiday, which was bad because the holiday was only about two weeks. Mm. Um, and it lives with you forever. And, and you get fired um, uh, and you never, often they don't tell you why. Mm. And you, you, you can lie awake at night thinking, oh, did I do this? Should I have said that? Was it that interview? You know, um, maybe I should have paid more attention to, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then you meet them years later and you say, you know, why did you do it? And they just say, well, oh, I fancied a change, you know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's no real reason whatsoever. Yeah. For the record, I've been fired by Gary Neville and, Ru <laughs> and Russell Watson, the opera singer. So there we go. I've, I've been fired by <laughs> Phil Neville. <laughs> <laughs> Neville he, Brothers. He wrote me a letter from... They were on tour with England or Man United in Brazil and he wrote me this letter and it starts off, Dear Alan, and then it went to legalese. It was four or five pages. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of my client reserves his judgment, but it was in Phil Neville's handwriting and he, he thought I wasn't going to notice. He'd obviously copied a lawyer's letter out, but he, he complained because um, I'd done a deal for him with OK Magazine and he was very upset because he didn't get as much coverage as the Beckhams and he couldn't understand why. I, mean, I think we all know say? why. Yeah. <laughs> and we, you know, you that was indiscreet of me to tell that, but so what? <laughs> You're in Manchester. It's, and then it's years a good, later, it's a good audience. not that long later, I was up at Old Trafford and I was at a game and I was at the front of the TV, and uh, front of the, uh, by the wall there. And I was watching this game and Phil Neville came over to take a throw in a few feet in front of me, <laughs> as close as you are there. So I'm yelling, you fuck, you know, all of this. Anyway, I've forgotten about it. And then someone says to me, have you seen Match of the Day? <laughs> and they've got a close up on this football fan yelling. And it says the fans are getting very abusive with Phil Neville. Luckily, I had a woolly hat on. So no one... I have never told that story before today, sorry. Brilliant. If only I was an uh, <laughs> evening news gossip columnist again, that would be <laughs> in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Mint story. I, I take that as a, a compliment to my interview skills that we're getting. You're going off message. Don't let me forget that one, Lily. We've got to use so, that in the future. <laughs> you know, you talked about not, you know, not having uh, hardly any holidays, these expectations, these, the pressure, you know, you, you carry the weight yeah. of these reputations on, on your back. Um, you know, you write in the book quite, you know, movingly about the sacrifice, really, that you have to make being stuck in some uh, uh, Midwestern USA town in a hotel somewhere. And, you know, you, and you, your home life suffered, didn't it? Your, your, your family back, uh, relationship yeah. stuff suffered. I mean, looking, you know, you look back and you, uh, you kind of, you, you don't seem, and I think, I would be the same to regret what you've, the life you've had, but it has taken a lot of emotional investment. Yeah, hasn't I guess it? you leave some sort of debris and turmoil behind. I mean, you don't. Um, there's no point in regretting it. I mean, I was driven by an instinct to do this from literally from the beginning. I mean, it's, I left school. I didn't go to university. I was in rock and roll as a teenager, really. Um, so this was, and there was never another plan. This is what I did, and, and of course. Um, it's quite different now, but in, in, say in the 80s, I'd be touring in America, um, and it was like being on the other side of the moon, because um, especially if you're on the West Coast, you couldn't call home because of the time differences, but again, you didn't have any social media mobiles, so there might be, you could wait until you got home from the gig at some holiday inn in sort of Denver or something like that, and then it would be too late to call home, and you'd be there in this room, and a in a, with a horrible coloured carpet on your own and mm. it would be I'd be very very lonely um, and then I'd, I'd be out there at Christmas or something you know and you'd be at an airport in, in, in you know I don't know San Diego or something and everyone's sort of going home to their families for Christmas and you're sitting there and you go to a radio station mm. you know with David Bowie or something mm. and um, yeah it was really lonely and I went through a thing um, with the Spice Girls when they were touring America and they were really big and I, I just got really frightened of flying and I'd always been fine with airplanes and I, I, every time I went on a plane I was coming out in this cold sweat and I, I was kind of having to take a tranquilizer and I couldn't get through the flight and I kind of and then it went and I realized what it was I just didn't want to be traveling anymore and I didn't want to be thousands of miles away on my own and often I would have to go in advance to set up the you know publicity before they got there so you really were on your own um, and 
Yeah, but I, you can't regret it because what a privilege and what incredible adventures. And um... well, certainly Bowie seems to be the defining, you know, artist client relationship of your life, really. Um, yeah. Such an important artist as well. And, and yet, there was a time, wasn't there, when incredible to think about that he, he wasn't, um, well, it's in the book, it's a great story, and, and you can tell the story of how, uh, he, to me, this is a real exemplar of how PR isn't just a sort of a nice to have, get an article in the paper, uh, you know, uh, vanity yeah. uh, work, work. It is really a central kind of strategy. Can you tell us about where Bowie was at that time in his career and what you did to, uh, to, yeah. to take it into a different gear? Yeah, I mean, Bowie, oh, funny enough, he'd, all, he'd been dropped in the uh, 70s after Low, which was such a seminal album, um, and that trilogy. I think Low had only sold 100,000 copies and he'd got dropped by the record label, uh, RCA. And then the next album, EMI took a punt and signed him up and he did this album called Let's Dance, which sold 10 million, so, you know. Um, but later on in the 90s, his career was... Um, he'd got to deal with Virgin Records and he was making albums like Heathen. They were really good records, but they yeah. weren't full of hit singles. Yeah. And the record industry went through this very misguided moment, I think it was around 2000, where they decided old artists were finished. Rod Stewart got dropped, Phil Collins dropped, got dropped, uh, I think even maybe the Sons, all the, all the old bands got dropped. Of course now, they're the legacy ones and they're the ones that make the record company some money. But anyway, um, Virgin decided, I had a call and they said, we're gonna have to let David go, um, which was a pretty big shock. So I thought, we're gonna, we've gotta get on the front foot here. We cannot have David Bowie dropped. It's just unthinkable because he's one of the most influential, important artists of all time. So I created a press release and it, it was like Christmas Eve or something. And I mean, we had an office party and I didn't go to the office party because I was writing this press release. And it was something like, Bowie quits Virgin, you know. <laughs> Bowie forms his own label and, you know, I, I concocted this whole story that there'd been, the record company had messed up in the legal department, there was a clause and he was able to storm out of the label and set up his own record company. Um, truth is he'd been dropped. Anyway, I got to the press first and it wasn't just the UK, um, it was America as well, LA Times, Los Angeles Times and, that, and they all went quite big with it. Bowie Lee's Virgin sets up own label and it, 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 it was really... Um, worked and I had a call from Virgin Records because um, it was Christmas they were probably a bit dozy mm. and I just went on it and it was really and then I got a call from some of the one of the senior guys at Virgin said don't tell anyone and I'm calling you but that was really stylish spin um, <laughs> and then about four or five weeks later David got a great new deal um, with Sony uh, with Rob Stringer so it all worked fine but you know you those moments, they're pivotal. I yeah. mean, a career could fall down a, fall down a hole. And that one press release... Yeah, him, and it wasn't just the trajectory. press release, really. I suppose it was just how... Well, it was the, I suppose it was the preemptive out. strike, the timing. It was a strike, yeah. wasn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let's talk about the 90s when, you know, um, Blair was in power the celebrity culture, uh, you know, Noel Gallagher at number 10, the Spice Girls, football. I think you make a really great point uh, in the book that uh, Princess Diana died and there was a yeah. vacuum for the glamorous, uh, the, the royalty of, of music and sport. And you became, <laughs> I mean, that really was a, a, heyday, a heyday for you, wasn't it, that, that decade? Or that era. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky because I, I had that moment in punk and then I had that moment, I guess, in the 80s, Bowie Stones. Um, but the 90s, Britain was the centre of the universe. I mean, everything was happening here. And, of course, Manchester United was happening, YBA, you know, Tracy Emin, all these artists were happening. Everywhere you look, it was just, it was a fantastic time. New Labour had come in. It was just, it was electric to be um, in Britain. And Diana had died. And I, I felt there was almost a sort of whiff of republicanism in the air. And there were polls in the papers at that time, even in things like The Sun, where there was a sort of question about would the monarchy survive? Because we all remember the, 
they, the royal family didn't play the diner thing particularly well at the beginning, and there was a lot of sympathy for her, uh, enormous amount. So it was, it was quite an interesting atmosphere. And then, of course, um, along came Spice Girls and the Beckhams and All Saints and Robbie and Oasis, and it was a really met, meet, it was sort of, you know, um, a really egalitarian sort of bottom-up type thing, and I loved it. It felt like punk to me. It was really exciting, and it was like kind of forget all the stuffy establishment and all these posh royals and this, that, and the and other. the tabloids were very central, weren't they? Tabloids, you know, uh, tabloids were really into it. And then you had, as I say, celebrity magazines like OK. And it felt, I almost saw the, sounds odd, but I almost saw the Spice Girls like a Sex Pistols. It was irreverent. They were making up as they went along. Um, and it was a really exciting moment for the UK. Really, really thrilling. I mean, look, I hope, you know, it's maybe a... Uh, I hope we're on the verge of another one because it's about time and the, the omens are good and if England win the football, you know, and whatever, it might, maybe we're going to have a, another moment. It would be great. I think something about that time that I got from Piers Morgan's diaries was yep. that Tony Blair was never off the phone to the uh, editors of the tablet and Alistair Campbell mm -hmm. on his behalf, which shows how powerful the, uh, the, the papers were then. Yep. Uh, the Sun claimed they somewhat won it in a, yeah. one, of, one of the elections but would you agree that the power of the press that, that the newspapers has waned uh, it's not the same because of you know social media because of fragmentation of of the media do you think the press are as powerful as they used oh to yeah be? It's, it's it's changed uh, incredibly i mean it was it was a sort of building to a peak um towards about 2000 i mean all the editors, I remember, would turn up. If You would have dinner with them at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and it would be clubs like Scott's, the Ivy. They'd turn up chauffeur-driven limos or whatever with the chauffeur hanging outside. And they would be all... And you'd have government ministers in there. They'd be sort of deciding the fate of the nation almost. I mean, and of course, I had a very central role, really, because I was representing, by that time, the Beckhams, uh, Spice, Elton... I can't remember, you know, I mean, a lot sure. of people. So I would often be in that top table. And it was, I remember, um, I'll give you a few examples. Alistair Darling, you remember, he's the Chancellor. Yes. I yes. got a call, could I meet him one night at the Ivy? And I went along and met him. And he said, uh, what he wanted to talk to, he said, oh, I want to talk to you about it. Was, I would like to talk to you about Bob Marley. <laughs> I go, okay, <laughs> so I know you've met Bob Marley. What was he like? <laughs> uh, Another time I got a call to go meet John Burko, who was the speaker in the house. And um, so I, I have never met John Burko. And I thought, well, what's this about? It's a bit weird. So I go down there. And um, there's the division bell goes, and he comes out, and there's some vote going on. And I go out on the terrace at the Commons. And he said, I, I want to know what David Bowie was really like. I'm, what? So I walk <laughs> up and down 15 minutes telling him about Bowie. And he said, oh, thank you very much. And he walks back in. I never saw or heard from him ever again. And I thought, this is some kind of weird service that I'm providing. And uh, of course, with Blair, we then get the thing with... Tony Blair was a real music fan, a massive Bowie fan. And um, I went down to the House of Commons uh, with Shakira. Shakira was a new artist, and she wanted to get some sort of cred. And her boyfriend was the Argentinian... Minister for Economics or something like that. Um, so a friend of mine who I knew, Kevin Brennan, who was an MP for Cardiff, had arranged a meeting with Gordon Brown. So I go down there to House of Commons and we're sitting with Gordon Brown and Shakira. And Gordon Brown is we're, I'm standing there for an hour, you know, and Brown is talking to Shakira and he's signing this book the long road, uh, Nelson Mandela's long road to freedom. I think it might be a long road to freedom. It's been a very long chat, this, and I'm still standing there. <laughs> and someone taps me on the shoulder and says, um, oh, Tony wants to have a word with you. Oh, this is very weird, because my brother's called Tony, and I'm thinking, oh, what's he doing there? I'm daydreaming by this time. He said, no, 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 you've got to come now. So I sort of follow this chap along, and, and then Shakira sees that I'm leaving the room and sort of scuttles along after me. Anyway, we go through this labyrinth of corridors, come out into an open space, not dissimilar to this in a way, and on the left-hand side are the household names, all these MPs, Claire Shaw and, you know, Prescott and everyone, and they're raging to go forward, and they're being sort of held back. And I look to my right, and there's a glass um, office, and there's Tony Blair just on his own walking up and down in this office. 
And Blair says, come in. So I go in and I'm, I have met Blair a few times and I know Alistair Campbell a bit. And I'm thinking, what's this about? Is Alistair quitting? You know, and he, you know what, what's going on? He, I said, um, Tony, this is Shakira, you know. And he said, um, <laughs> he says, uh, Tony says, oh, he said, jolly good. I, I love you, Shakira. You're very good. My, my kids saw you in Top of the Pops last week. You thought you were marvellous. Jolly good. And she's looking a bit crestfallen because she hasn't even been on Top of the Pops, you know. And he said, um, he said, Anyway, Alan, it's you I want to talk to. And I think, well, wh why? You know, what's going on? You know, as, um, as I said, I thought it was Alistair quit or something, you know. He said, yeah, I've, I've got to talk to you about something really important. I mean, what is it? He said, the new Bowie album. Are the drums being done in Switzerland or New York? <laughs> and he carried on like this for about five minutes. It was like meeting, sitting down with Mark Ellen, the editor of Q magazine. Yeah, yeah. And at the end, he said, oh, well, jolly good. I just wanted to know how the album's coming on anyway. And... I was sort of dismissed, and I end up on the street with Shakira, who's looking <laughs> bewildered, and didn't stay with me for long after that as a client, I must, I must say. So did I don't you, know if that answered the question. Talk about no, politics no, and you, music were quite tight you, at that uh, did time. Did you ever get involved in, um, you know, political, in, in politics, PR, around politicians and the government? Did, you, did, did your career extend to that area? Uh, not directly. I got yeah. to know David Miliband a bit, um, mm -hmm. and um, I had quite a few chats with him, and he, he was just inspirational, very intelligent guy, and, mm. but I, I never actually did it. Well, it's a whole, it is a whole specialist area, that, isn't yeah. it? That's why I ask. Um, but no, I, I didn't do any uh, actual representation. That sure. would have been terrifying, really, wouldn't it? I'm just going to remind the audience, I want to remind you because the first time I've mentioned it, but we do want some questions uh, from the floor. So uh, start thinking them up. In about five minutes, I'll ask you to put your hands up. Easy ones, please. That would be, that'd be great. Uh, give me a rest. Um, you did an exhibition uh, in 2015, Always Print the Myth, PR in the yeah. Modern Age. And which is something that Tony Wilson used to, uh, <laughs> used to uh, declare. Um, and I believe the quote originally is from the movie director John Ford about, about his westerns. Oh, yeah. um, I just wonder if you would use that now, uh, given, you know, ethics, integrity. Is it, is it the same 10 years, almost 10 years on, with public perception of... Uh, of what journalists do, of what politicians do? Or do we give a pass to rock and roll that we kind of want to collude in stories that, you know, that I never knew Jimi Hendrix's guitar was went up in flames because yeah. the manager told him to. Yeah. I thought it was spontaneous, you know. Um, would you use that title now? I don't know, basically. You know, is that, that's the question. What always print the myth? Mm. Uh, maybe not. I mean, the... That was only 2015, but everything's changed. The media's changed out of all proportion then. I mean, I sometimes feel like the, the gatekeeper, but there's no fence. Um, <laughs> you know, and a lot of things changed. Technology changed it. Everyone became a citizen reporter. Everyone could, you know, phone and obviously social media. And then, you know, the whole Leveson thing sort of devalued media a bit. But the, the truth is, um, now the media moves so fast and so quickly. Yeah. Um, often newspapers are sort of catching up, really. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 I mean, uh, it's an exclusive, you know, when I was a PR, I used to or arrange an exclusive with a certain paper. But is it worth anything anymore when it all goes online and everyone can copy it out anyway? I mean, do, do you still it's, it's work exclusive? Exclusives are pretty, generally pretty impossible. And also because it's such a global situation now. So if I put out a release on The Who, I'll be getting calls within 10 minutes from people in Brisbane or San Francisco or whatever. So yeah. um, you, you can't really control it. I suppose you could, you still could if it's a big rollout, in-depth interview, like the one that I think Taylor Swift did with Vogue or something like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. then everyone has to get the, get the interview and credit Vogue. But generally, not now. It's a lot of information appearing all over the place quickly. Okay. Um, I did want to ask you about, you know, friendship with these famous people. And you, you described David as a, as a friend, but was, of course, you worked so closely with him. You had yeah. a close relationship. Is there always a slight, because it's business as well, 
that you can yeah. never really be. Yeah, they're yeah, busy. yeah. They're busy, mate. You know. Yeah, yeah. You, you're not. I mean, you, you want to be. Sometimes you can be very friendly, but you're not their friends because there is a bit of upstairs, downstairs. You have to, you have to sort of bear that in mind. I, I remember David Bowie calling him up about. I've been working for him for 20 years, and he called me up. And he said, "Alan, he said I, I've, I've worked something out." I said, "What's that, David?" He said. I can never get you between three and five on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and he said, I've worked it out. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you're a football fan, aren't you? You go to football. I said, yeah. So that's after 20 years of working for him. So much as I had at times a very close relationship, I didn't exactly go down the pub with him. Yeah. The only, only, and it's, it's, people say, well, how did you manage to survive nearly four decades with David? And I always think of the moth and the candle. You don't, you're, you're not their mate. You know, once you cross that line, and I've seen people do it, and you start going on, you know, sort of their yacht or foreign holidays, mm. it's probably, you, you then haven't got any perspective. You can't advise them, honestly. Mm. Um, you're compromised. Um, You've got to be a critical friend as well. You have but, to, but to me, do it. When David Bowie plays you, you his latest album, we, did you feel obliged to say it's brilliant or did you ever say that one track's better than well that? you don't want to be too critical for him, i can tell <laughs> you that'll be that'll cost you i mean i do remember going into um i think he was playing me a record and i was thinking i better be really prepared for this so i'd looked up thesaurus and and i had all my adjectives and i'd written down a list i had 30 40 ways of saying brilliant great amazing incredible and I was making sure they had two or three for each song. And this I is just, a man that does his research. I, uh, yeah, I just about, and I had the bit of paper under the desk, and I still was managing to come up with them towards the end. Really? I mean, it, <laughs> luckily, it was a great record. The only artist I would say that I have a more sort of personal relationship with is quite randomly is Roger Daltrey of The Who. And that's because Roger's a big football fan. Mm -hmm. And he calls me up every Saturday. We follow the same team. He calls me up after the match, wherever he is in the world. Um, and he'll discuss the match in depth, you know, the offside decisions, the goal kicks or whatever. And we don't talk about music at all. Right. And I get that call literally, Chandra will say, within 15 or 20 minutes well, of every single match. What it, do you think, Alan? No, he was wrong, wasn't he? He, was, he, you know. he, he obviously always has come across as a real, authentic, genuine person. But maybe that's the brilliance of your PR, Alan. No, no, no. Ro Ro Roger's yeah. absolutely authentic. So, um, final question before I throw it open. Um, has, the, has the fun got out of, uh, of the PR media environment? I mean, I don't just mean for uh, the, all the kind of Wild West stuff that used to go yeah. on, but also for the reader or the consumer, because it's obvious that celebrity PR, you know, film actors, music artists, it's so controlled now. Yeah. So, no one wants to say anything remotely controversial. Politics used to be, you know, a big subject area for bands. It seems that uh, off, off it's quite much. anodyne now. I mean, yeah. I don't, that's, that's my feeling. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's largely true. I mean, one thing I, I mean, and I've had, I can't stand the, the media junket where people are brought in and they'll do 30 or 40 interviews during a day. They're all sound bites. And you will have the American, it usually is American, you, but you might have the agent saying, you've got to make sure everyone stays on message, you know, or stay in line, you know. And it's sort of like, so everyone really asks the same two or three questions, promoting the book or the record or the film or whatever it is. Um, and it's considered a successful press junket. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think in the short term, yeah, maybe it is. It plugs whatever film it is. Um, but the long term, we're, we're all the public. I'm the public. I read things. Um, and, you know, you, it, it becomes meaningless, this stuff. You don't get an in-depth where yeah. you really get an insight into what this person is. And, and I, I know that I followed people um, because I felt I knew them, you know, Lou Reed or something. I'd read these interviews and I felt I had a real understanding of who he was, not just the music. And I followed his career for 30 or 40 years. And I think it's very hard to do that now when mm. it is, as you say, very anodyne, mm. very on message. Um, and I, I, think that's, I think that's a mistake, mm. actually. And actually we got, whether it was Lou Reed or other artists, you got a feel for their career and their, their personality and everything about them through brilliant writers yeah. like Tony Parsons, Paul Borley, Ian Penman. 
because they had time, I suppose, to spend with them. They could go on the road with them, or they could, yeah. they could spend an afternoon with them. Now they're in and out within 20 minutes, aren't they? You know, it's, yeah, well, I, I was I talking to a promoter the other day, and he wanted to stage um, an event just outside London. I said, well, it won't work, you know. Uh, and he said, why? I said, well, journalists won't actually travel out of London. And he said, what do you mean? That's just five miles. I said, well, most of them now, sadly, if you've got journalist friends, maybe, a lot of them haven't got jobs, they're not paid properly, they're on contracts, they're freelancers, they're getting paid tiny amounts of money. So they don't really have the luxury of saying, right, okay, well, I'll travel out, I'll spend a day hanging out with this artist or yeah. a couple of days, I'll yeah. really get to know them, really do an in-depth. In they're more likely taking it off social media um, because of the economics of it. And it, it, it really does kill the art. Yeah. Um, I would say, however, it doesn't mean there's not great things going on on social media and Instagram and TikTok. I'm not living in the past, because at the end of the day, it is all storytelling. Mm. But that really beautiful, where you get a long insight mm. into an artist type, I mean, it's, it's getting very rare now. Yeah, well, tension spans, are, you know, NME, you yeah, get 5,000 word features. Does the public want it? I mean, I look at NME now, which is a great, it's a great magazine, and it's a good soundbite to what's going on. But you wouldn't get five pages about Nick Drake in there. No. Um, no. And maybe yeah. people don't want five pages about well, Sid Barrett or whatever, you know. Yeah. And Q Magazine has folded, yeah, hasn't so, it? Yeah, so, you know, we, we, we adapt. There's always good stories, but they come out in different ways. I mean, they'll come out, if anyone's seen ABBA, the hologram, which I went to with a sort of mixed emotion. I mean, <laughs> technically incredible. I also thought, oh my God, this is like the end of live music. But, you know, that's a great way of keeping the ABBA story alive and it will last in its way. And I'm sure we'll get to see a gig in the not too distant future with Sinatra backed by Keith Moon and Jimi Hendrix on guitar, you know. And I think we have to sort of try and embrace it wow. rather than I, just live in the past. I can't wait for Taylor Swift back by the Sex Pistols to be. <laughs> but yeah, so that'll be a goodie. On, on that note, we will move over to you guys. I'm sure you've got some, you've got some questions. So we'll... I will go right to the back first and then come forward. Uh, I think microphone coming around. All right. Alan, that was great. Really enjoyed it. I could talk to you all night. Um, great. Um, What's your name, by the way? I'm Chris Bridget. Hi, Chris. Good to meet you. I'm um, interested in your take on artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got a take on that, all right. Yeah, I bet you have. I think we all have. I'm a musician and um, I think the future's quite... Um, it's a little bit frightening, um, but it's also, I think, uh, very interesting as well. Yeah. Do you see um, in the not too distant future um, the possibility of a fully AI artist at the top of the charts and being represented by a PR company in that traditional sense? Obviously, we're all slaves to the algorithm and. That yeah. is, is, mm -hmm. is obviously um, where most people discover new music now. It's not through press and radio, it's through the yeah. algorithm. Yeah. So do you see a role for someone like yourself in PR when it comes to AI? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And there's a couple of bits to sort of, a couple of layers to that thing. I mean, firstly, my thoughts on AI. I mean, like all of us, or most of us, I've, I play around with GPT sometimes. So I could write a press release about this evening. I could come up with a couple of sentences and within 30 seconds get a beautifully tailored sort of release. And that's like, in one way, you think that's, that's fantastic. It's incredible. But I'll tell you a downside that I noticed that happened to me last week. Um, uh, I, I went up on Amazon to, to look for my book. And there's a book out there about me. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't know anything about this. And it's completely AI generated. I bought wow. a copy. Um, <laughs> and it's my story by someone who's been invented. They bought the photograph from somewhere. It's selling for 15 pounds. Don't go and buy it, please. Amazon have, have left it up there. Now, it doesn't really matter. I was mildly flattered. I thought, well, that's great. I've got a bootleg, you know, you must be happening, you know. <laughs> but if you think now what could happen you know, um, any big book, Caledonian Road, anything coming out, if that's AI, then, and with music, obviously the potential for that um, piracy is enormous. Answer to your question, yes, I do think it's around the corner. I think it will happen. Um, and in terms of the PR, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to the era where the PR can be a hologram and you can see me at the bar yeah. on the phone having a drink, <laughs> but really I'm at home watching Match of the Day. <laughs> Brilliant. I hope that answered it a bit. Okay. <laughs> we had some hands up at the front here earlier. Hi, good evening. Hello. Um, quick question. Are there any artists that you would have liked to have represented? Yes. Um, it cuts me quite easy. I mean, there's a lot. They're not... Um, they're really ones that are not around. I mean, they're quite a strange mix. Uh, Handel, Hendrix and Sinatra. Sinatra, what an iconic... I read a book um, by his PR, who's 97 years old last year, um, and it was all like meeting in Vegas in the middle of the night and private planes and meeting with the mob, and I, that's, come on, that's got to be exciting, isn't it? I'd love to have done that. And, of course, he's a beautiful singer. Um, Hendrix, because I kind of feel I knew Hendrix because Keith, my boss, used to talk about him all the time and yeah. tell stories, and... I sometimes find myself telling Hendrix stories, and I think, hang on, it wasn't me, that was Keith. But um, what a, what a, I mean, great, great music, and what an interesting character. I mean, so many things about Hendrix people don't know. I mean, he nearly fought in the Vietnam War, he was a soldier. I mean, just a great story. And then Handel, um, because I think Handel was, uh, apart from the fact I really love the music, but he kind of used to be around London in, in, in clubs and restaurants and you know, theatres, and it'd be like his career was a bit flat, so he'd be sticking up some posters to promote the latest gig. And then he thought, oh, God, there's a new king. Was it King George III? I'd better write a hit for him. And so, in a way, he was a very, very contemporary artist. So mm. those, those would be my three. Br brilliant, brilliant answer. Um, hand here. I, uh, you're, you're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed this. Um, I'm a very Thanks. big David Bowie fan, um, and I wondered, from what I know about Bowie, at least just from a, a you know punter's perspective, he seems to be someone who's very switched on with the business and kind yeah. of his own uh, mythology and reinventing himself. Do you find that that aided you, or sometimes was quite a hindrance? In that, did you find like you had to challenge his ideas of? how he wanted to present himself versus what you thought would benefit him most in the public eye? Great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, mostly he challenged me um, because he, he, he was never looking back, David. He's always had a new idea. So he'd ring up one day and say, I've, I've decided to design wallpaper. And like, I think, well, how do you do that? You know, I better learn about the wallpaper industry and how we promote it. I mean, another day, um, he obviously got very involved in, in art. He rung me up one day and said, um, yeah, I'm on the board of Modern, modern Painters, which was a very respected, you know, magazine, Lucian Freud and everyone's on it. He said, I can't make the board meeting. Can you do it for me? So I'm, I'm like quickly trying to read about, you know, Damien Hirst and everyone in a hurry and go and attend this board meeting with all these real <laughs> art historians and be David Bowie. So he was always stretching you. Mm. Um, occasionally, I would have to say to David, look, I don't think that works. So that was really, really hard. He made one record, um, which uh, I, I think it was called Toy, anyway. I, don't, I just didn't think it was right at the time or commercial. And it was really hard having this conversation with, with David saying, look, you know, it's a great record, but I'm not sure we should put it out at this moment in time. And you're thinking, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get sacked over this. Really difficult. Um, and I, I had this conversation, and I didn't hear from him for three days. And you're thinking, oh, my God, P45 is going to come in the post. Um, but it was never mentioned again, and the record never came out. Um, hmm. So occasionally, yes, but n not often, because, you know, the, David Bowie is like a, a Mozart or a prince. He's a proper genius. So it wasn't, wasn't my job to be telling him what, what music to do. Great, great story as well in the answer have we got any more that's a new one we haven't done yeah. that either okay, no, we've, we've, we've that we can call a few out of you tonight haven't we <laughs> excellent you've got a lot of new material yeah. haven't you yeah I hope we don't haven't got any lawyers in here because I <laughs> might be in trouble with some of journalists. these especially Phil Neville's lawyer if you're around <laughs> God forbid any journalists final question you're the PR lady aren't you she is oh, OK magazine oh OK we love OK <laughs> 
So uh, back in the day, I worked at OK when we were doing so all the you, deals. So you remember Richard Desmond I and the indeed, million pound deal. Yeah. And Martin Townsend. Hello, Colette. How are you? <laughs> yeah. um, Where's my cigars? I, I remember you being incredibly patient and tolerant. Um, we've just had the 25th anniversary for David Victoria. Yeah. There was a lot of money knocking around then. Are you glad those days are over, despite it being so lucrative? Oh, what you mean from the magazine mm, world? Mm. I mean, the famous million pound deal where, mm. where Richard Desmond called me up and said, um, they called me over at nine o'clock at night, come over to my office. Um, so I said, really? He said, well, look out of your window and you, you'll see a Bentley and a, my chauffeur. Get in that and come over. Another, well, I've never been in chauffeur driven Bentley before I do that. So I go to the Docklands and he said, um, he said, uh, he said, Alan, um, I'll offer you a million pounds for pictures of the Beckham's wedding. And I'm thinking, a million pounds? I was thinking, well, all the other offers totaled 125,000 pounds. And I, my rudimentary mathematics tell me that this is good. <laughs> so I'm going, yeah, sounds, I should think we might be able to do that. He said, one caveat though, you have to sign the deal now before you leave the room. Okay. And I'm thinking, oh my God, the Beckhams are on a plane to Los Angeles and I know I can't contact them. So I'm thinking, what do I do, you know? <laughs> um, so I took the risk and signed this deal for, you know, whatever. Next morning I have to call Victoria. I get her in LA and I say, Victoria, I've got some important news to tell you. And she said, what is it? I said, well, this man, Richard Desmond, you've never heard of in the magazine, okay? They've offered a million pounds for your pictures. And they said, you've got, but you have to sign it now. There's a silence on the phone. And she said, please tell me you did effing sign the deal. <laughs> um, and I did. So it, it, was a, it, was a, it really was a great moment. And everything was done in style and everyone was drinking champagne. And it was, it was like you imagined that moment. Of course, now um, the media business is not like that. Everything's done in a shoestring. I mean, far from getting a record company or a magazine to fly you around the world... Um, you'd be lucky if you got a bus out to Ealing, wouldn't you? Yeah. You got yeah. that charge yeah. back. So, yeah, they, they were, that was a golden era, wasn't it? Was. It? it was. It was very good fun. Well, <laughs> well thanks for that question. And uh, we're getting to be timed out now. I just want to, uh, and Alan's obviously going to sign some books uh, for those who, who want them. It's a fa fantastic book. And the line that really jumped out at me that I'll leave you with is Alan Wright's, I got to see the process of culture being made in music, in fashion, in politics. And also, he doesn't, he's too modest to say that he was part of that culture as well. So uh, I want you to give it up for Alan. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and Andy, great questions. I was a bit Forrest Gump sometimes, just walking into all this stuff. And, and some really interesting questions from out there tonight. Thank you for that. And I've got to say a big thank you to this gentleman hiding here in the white jumper. Yeah. Um, Matt Bancroft. Matt Bancroft. Who I've got to know who coming up to the Rylands over the last three, four, five years now. What an incredible space. This is a very, very beautiful room. And what they're doing with it is brilliant. And I, I feel privileged to even be sitting in this place. So thanks, Matt. Brilliant. Uh, so, as um, Andy mentioned, Al Alan's happy to uh, sign a few books at the back. There's some already signed, but he's happy to personalise them as well. So if you're thinking about picking up a copy, head towards the back and then um, you can head out down the stairs at the far side. And thanks again for coming. And I'm sure just one final round of applause for Andy Spinoza and Alan Edwards. <laughs> <laughs>